Hi, I'm Pastor Kevin Baird of Legacy Church here in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm so glad you tuned in today to Legacy Media. This ministry is supported by the faithful tithes and offerings of all of our members that attend this local church. They are glad to be a part of this outreach. But you might want to be a part of our extended family and help us as we enlarge and reach more people. So if you feel so led, maybe you'd like to send a gift to us, large or small. We're a church, nonprofit organization. And you can send that gift to Legacy Church, 1401 Sam Rittenberg Boulevard, Charleston, South Carolina. 29407. We also invite you to check out our website at www.legacychurchsc.org. We hope you stay with us. Enjoy the message you're about ready to hear. Again, I'm so glad you tuned in. God bless. the tomb they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed but he said to them do not be alarmed you seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified he is risen he is risen and and the reason I just am drawn to this is because here are some women just being faithful, coming to complete what they needed to do after the horror of a crucifixion. And they walk to the, the graveyard, and as they're walking to the graveyard, they simply say to themselves, we've got a stone in the way, and who's going to roll it away? And it just struck me that they're coming to complete the burial, not realizing that they're getting ready to experience a miracle. And I wonder how many people today, you're sort of the same way. You've come and you've got things that seem like it's fallen apart. It hasn't worked out. Didn't shake the way you'd planned it. Maybe even worse than that. And you're walking and just being faithful. But really inside you're just wondering, how in the world is this going to be solved? How are my, the stones of my life going to be rolled away? How in the world is this ever going to be any different? And I want to encourage you this morning that maybe you came in ready to complete a burial in your life but I'm here to tell you you ought to come expecting a miracle because the same Jesus that we read about here that was raised from the dead is the same Jesus who's alive today that can raise you up from wherever you are he's the same Jesus that can roll away stones he's the same Jesus that can show up when you least expect him and he can do it even in a service like this this morning I realize it's an Easter service we do this every year and untold scores of millions of people are gathering in churches all over the world and they'll celebrate but this is your place and your moment and your time and I believe God can meet you here in resurrection power do you believe that I believe that we're gonna celebrate him with all we've got this morning so Lord we do, we rejoice in you. We rejoice that it's not a story that we just read or some fairy tale, but that, Lord, this is an account of something that is as real as right now. You are alive. You are well. You are seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. And, Lord, you're awaiting that moment when you hear the command and you're coming back for us. And so, Lord, we come with expectancy this day. Some of us, some of us have been just overwhelmed by life. And to be honest, we made our way to the house of God thinking, how in the world can it ever be different? Lord, we choose to begin to expect miracles this morning. That the same Jesus that we'll hear about will be the Jesus experientially that will come and touch each one of our lives. So, Lord, we're going to expect and in our celebration, we're going to let that expectation arise. And we will meet with you today, our risen Lord. We love you with everything we've got. We give it all up for you. You are not dead. You are alive. You are risen now. And we love you, for it's in the name of Jesus we pray. And all the people said, come on, let's lift our voices and let's worship him. 
All right, get your Bibles, and we're going to be uh, speaking for a few moments out of First and Second Corinthians. No, I won't be reading to you the whole letters of, of Paul, but uh, we're going to read a substantial portion of chapter 15 of First Corinthians, and then I, I want to leap over to Second Corinthians and just read one verse out of chapter 11. But as I was preparing for this great Sunday, I thought to myself, what does a pastor say after 30 years of Easter sermons? I mean, what do you say that hasn't already been said and probably said better in numerous places on another occasions? And today there are, they tell me, 1.5 billion people, many of whom, of course, call themselves Christian, who are celebrating somewhere in the world today the resurrection of Jesus Christ and together are recounting the resurrection story. It's a story that everyone gravitates to because it's the greatest comeback story to have ever happened. And of course, we're going to celebrate the good news as well today. And with all due respect to the 1.5 billion who perhaps are just like us, I just want to share a few moments on what I entitled, The Jesus I Celebrate. The Jesus I Celebrate. I celebrate. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, bear with me, uh, but it's good to hear Scripture. So uh, we're going to read together, and uh, you can watch over the, overhead on the screen. And I just want you to let what Paul began to say about the resurrection sink into your spirit. This is what he said. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, not separately, at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. Some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished if in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men the most pitiable and then leap over just to one verse in 2nd Corinthians 11 4 he follows up with the Corinthian church with this letter and he says many things but this is the one we're going to zero in on it says for if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. And again, I want to share just for a moment the Jesus I celebrate. Now, <clears throat> I want to start by laying a quick context of the Corinthian church because it's strikingly similar to the 21st century American church. Corinthian uh, and the church was an exciting place to be for that time period. There were miracles, gifts, there was spontaneity, there were 
exciting teachers to listen to. In fact, they turn their Christian teachers into Christian celebrities. But as well as the exciting things, there was also heresy. There was division. There was immorality, gross immorality. And it's amazing that it all existed at the same time in the same church. And Paul would do his best to get all these things straightened out. He tells them in the second letter that a part of their problem was that he was tolerating people who were teaching or who were preaching and bringing to them what he said was another Jesus, a different Jesus, a different gospel, a different spirit than what they had originally been taught. In fact, Paul was reminding them as to what he wrote in the first letter that I read to you, that lengthy passage of Scripture. Now, we're going to get back to these things in just a moment, but, but just to make the leap to the 21st century, I, I just want to share with you that I think we're living in a time that historians, I am convinced, will label this era the age of redefinition. We are conveniently redefining just about everything from words to relationships to institutions. People are redefining the word love, the word sin. They're redefining grace, tolerance, bigotry, while they've even redefined truth, family, marriage, perversion. We are redefining all of these concepts to mean whatever we want them to mean as long as it fits with our current mentalities or feelings or situations. So it should not surprise us that even Jesus himself is being redefined. And we too are beginning to see a different Jesus, a different gospel, a different spirit. It's all starting to be tolerated. I'm finding that people are either overemphasizing one aspect of Jesus to the neglect of other aspects, or they're just making up their own Jesus. That's frustrating. It certainly is for me. I'm a pastor, and I'm certainly committed first to Jesus, but I'm also committed to the integrity of the Bible and the account of his life and the words that he spoke and the revelation that he gave his followers. And the real Jesus tends to get lost in the crowd of all the created Jesuses. So I just want to share with you, at least as I've come to understand it, seven Jesus, is it Jesuses or Jesuses? Jesuses. I want to share with you seven of them that I think are currently declared or currently preached or taught in our land. The first one I call the Gandhi Jesus. The Gandhi Jesus. This is the nonviolent, social justice, philosopher under the tree Jesus. This Jesus, of course, was an incredible teacher of men. In fact, he was a lot like a philosophy professor. He sat under trees, much like Aristotle or Plato or Socrates, and he would just pontificate these powerful philosophical concepts that he wanted everyone to embrace. And much like Gandhi, Jesus, by the sheer force of the moral imperative, would move people to, to servanthood and love just by his moral goodness and his consistency. And, and so this is the Jesus that sometimes gets taught and emphasized. I call him the Gandhi Jesus. But then let's not forget number two. There's the Westboro Baptist Jesus. Now this is the epithet hurling Jesus. This is the shout at you, Jesus. This is the Jesus that walks around with a chip on his shoulder, waiting for a reason to kick you out of his kingdom. And that usually doesn't take a lot. This Jesus wants to be sure that you know you're not only under judgment, but you can probably never get out from under judgment. This is the Jesus that wants you to know that he hates more things than you've ever imagined. Justice awaits you. And he'll be more than happy to meet it out in your life. That's sort of the Westboro Baptist Jesus. But then there's the third one, the emergent Jesus. Now, this is the Rob Bell, everyone gets to heaven and there could never be a hell Jesus. This is the Jesus that never excludes anyone. 
Because you know Jesus is love and he'll tolerate anything. He'll overlook everything. In fact, really, this is the polar opposite Jesus of the Westboro Jesus. The Westboro Jesus really accepts nothing, but the emergent Jesus really takes anything and everything. In fact, everyone will ultimately make it. It doesn't really matter how you live, what you do, what you say. In fact, this Jesus really likes all the questions. In fact, there are probably more questions than there are answers. And so your inquisitive nature is an indicator enough that you're a genuine seeker. You're an alienator of none. In fact, this Jesus basically says that heaven and hell are actually being lived out right now and there'll be none of that in the world to come. But then there's number four. This is the Oprah Jesus. This is the Jesus that walks arm in arm with Buddha and Muhammad. It's, it's, it's like they're all just sort of like this, this great triple threat tag team. I mean, Jesus is this guy that he's handing out everybody's holy book. I mean, really, they all just say the same thing, and we're all of the same spirit. And Jesus is just one of the team members of the one world religion team. We'll even maybe give him the quarterback position, but, but he's, he's just another part of the team. And, and this is the Jesus that is simply repackaging all the wisdom of the ages into a different form so that, that another segment of humanity can be touched. Jesus was just rebranding what all the other religions really stood for and taught. In fact, Jesus was really just the master marketer. He was the one that just sort of, sort of synthesized it all together. That's the Oprah Jesus. But then number five, I'm finding there's a life coach Jesus out there. This is the motivational Jesus. This is the you can have your best life here and now Jesus. And it's really fascinating that uh, there would even be books written on that because I'm here to tell you if this is my best life here and now, then Jesus done lied to us all. This isn't your best life. In fact, the whole point was he promised another life. But there's the life coach Jesus wanting to make sure you experience the best and the blessing. This is the Jesus that wants you healthy, wealthy, in a Fortune 500 company. This is the Jesus that gives you keys and tips for promotions in order that you can get that big position that you've always been wanting this Jesus is the motivator that will get you to the top if you'll just plug in all of those verses now this Jesus will never tell you about doctrine because doctrine just gets in the way of your trek to success for God's best here and now but then there's number six I call him the Starbucks Jesus this is the Jesus that embraces and affirms whatever feeling or attraction you may have going on inside of you. Because Jesus would have never wired you with those things if he didn't expect you to use them. In fact, this Jesus, while tolerant of every aberration imaginable, is mostly intolerant of anyone who might actually take his words literally. In fact, Jesus was probably wired a little differently himself because, you know, he hung around a lot of guys. And who's to say? That's the Starbucks Jesus. And then number seven, and I'll just leave it here, it's the grandparent Jesus. This is the I'm just going to wink at you and let you get by with any behavior and think it's cute Jesus. This Jesus is the one of whom Abraham Lincoln said that you could fool all the time. You see, you're one of Jesus' kids, and he lets his kids get by with everything because, you know, his patience endures forever. This Jesus lets you slide. This Jesus lets you throw tantrums. This Jesus lets you get away with rebellion and would defend your right to throw rocks at cars even because you're just a misunderstood person in his kingdom. Now, the point that I'm trying to make in all of these other Jesuses is that since the first century, people have been making their own Jesus up, trying to fit their own perspective. 
And I found that it is next to impossible to change people's minds. It seems as if we're living in a day that Jesus can be created by whomever and however folks want to do it, and that's just the way it is. And so I'm already beginning to learn that to even challenge a perspective of Jesus is to solicit hostility and great response. And so I'm really coming to the conclusion that it's almost next to impossible to change people's minds and only God ultimately can do that. So for today, I decided that there's not going to be a sermon with apologetics. I'm not going to give you a, a reasoned or rational explanation for the resurrection. I'm not going to try to convince or reconvince any of you that the evidence for Christianity is overwhelming and it's logical and it makes sense and that's why you should embrace it. I decided today that I'm simply going to share on the Jesus that I celebrate. Because he may or may not be the same Jesus you're celebrating. And so I just want to share with you what I've come to understand through the scriptures and what I've read to you as to the Jesus I celebrate. The Jesus I celebrate, number one, died for me. He died for me. Now, we can obviously look to Jesus for a number of inspiring and helpful things. But the gospel starts with the simple yet the profound premise that because all of us are born in sin, something had to die and blood had to be shed. So many of the current pictures of Jesus and the gospel seem to overlook or even discount the truth that sin exists. You know, I remember, I'm old enough now to remember, and I can now think back, and, 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 and I'm getting to the place where now I'm having these fond memories. And I can remember back in the 1980s that there was a book that was written that's, that started to document in psychology this very dynamic. It was written by a guy named Menninger, and the title of the book was, Whatever Happened to Sin? Whatever happened to sin in the whole book was premised on the fact that, that even in the 80s we were beginning to slide down a path that sin was no longer going to be something we were going to talk about. There were no more rights and wrongs. And here we are nearly a generation later facing it in even a more acute way. You see, if there's no sin, then why did Jesus die? I mean, if we're holy and clean in and of ourselves, then why the shedding of blood? You see, the Jesus I celebrate became my substitute. He took the penalty of sin and the wrath of judgment that should have fallen upon me, but he took it upon himself. And he took it upon himself as my substitute in order that I might have access to a holy, loving, heavenly father. He bore the repercussions of my sin in order that I might live and have a relationship with God. There's an old story that years ago I would tell, and it just came to mind again, of an old railroad switchman whose job, as I understood it, was to sit in a, a glass, almost like tower, uh, over a bridge that spanned a river. And his job was that as boats would come by the river, he was, to, he was to open up the bridge in order that the boats might pass. And then as he would get signals, he would close the bridge in order that the trains could go across the river. One day, he decided to take his young boy to work with him. And as he was doing his job and going about his duties, time had slipped by until finally he heard the radio signal that a train was coming and, and the bridge was in its up position. And so he was signaled in order to bring the bridge down so the train might pass. And he was about ready to push the buttons and use the mechanisms that would be used in order to accomplish that when he noticed that his boy was nowhere to be found. And as he looked out of that glass tower, he saw down in the mechanisms of the bridge, there his boy had slipped out and was playing in the midst of the mechanisms. He began to surmise that there wasn't enough time for him to get out of his tower and go down and pull his boy off the mechanisms. For if he were to do that, the bridge could not come down in time for the train to pass. But if he dropped the bridge and allowed the train to pass, beyond a shadow of a doubt, his boy would be caught in the mechanism and he would be killed beneath the weight of the bridge. And in the few seconds that this father had to begin to just surmise the whole situation that was before him, he was confronted with a choice. Do I allow the bridge to come down in order that the people who are in the train might pass? 
and, 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 or do I save my son and allow all those that are in the train to die in a, in a raised bridge? And so in a split instant, he made the horrific choice that any father could not even imagine making. He pushed the buttons and he moved the mechanisms and he dropped the bridge. And in dropping the bridge, he was sacrificing his very son. The interesting thing was that as he stood in the tower and his, as he was weeping, as he was pushing the buttons in order to drop the bridge that the train might go by, he was able to see in the, in the passenger cars all of the people who were on the train and they were celebrating and they were laughing and, and they were having their big time as they were passing over this bridge, not able to know or even understand that there was a father on the other side of a glass who was weeping profoundly that he had given up his son in order that they might pass to safety. Jesus was that boy in order that you and I on that train might pass. And I celebrate a God, a Jesus who willingly shed his blood. He willingly walked to the cross. Understand, nobody took him there. Nobody drug him there. He willingly laid his life down for me. And I celebrated Jesus who took my sins my sins and Jesus said put it on me father put Kevin's sins upon me that he might come to know you that's the Jesus I celebrate it was the greatest act of love ever in human history Jesus doesn't come along patting me on the back saying, oh, there, 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 I understand all your sins. Jesus isn't just a back patter, but he took his sins and he placed them on his back to carry them far, far away. He died for me. He died for you. That's the Jesus I celebrate. But number two, I celebrate a Jesus who was buried to go get the keys. That's what Paul said in that letter to the Corinthians. He said that he was, he was killed, he died, and he was buried. A lot of people never are taught this, and so I thought I'd take a moment this morning just to help you understand why it was that Jesus was buried. I mean, God could have raised him up, I would suppose, in a few hours after what took place on the cross, but he was buried. And the reason Jesus was buried, and there were three days and three nights in a grave was because there were some things that were going on. Let me assure you, in those three days and three nights, there was a lot of activity happening. You never hear much about this, but I just want to share with you out of the Bible what was going on those three days and three nights Jesus was in the grave. In Ephesians 4, 8 through 9, it says this. It says, therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. Listen to verse 9. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. So in this time period that Jesus was buried in the grave, he literally descended, the scripture says, into the lower parts of the earth. That's what's going on in these three days he's in the grave. Now what was he doing those three days? Well, First Peter 3 18 through 19 tell us it says for Christ suffered once for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but made alive by the spirit next verse by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison so people sometimes will come to me and say well pastor what happened to all those Old Testament saints in the in the Old Testament that were serving God righteously and of course they were working under a sacrificial system and they never saw Jesus they never met Jesus how in the world does all of this work and while we can't get into the whole thing because that would make an interesting teaching in and of itself the fact of the matter is if they died an Old Testament saint died righteously they went to this holding tank called Hades and in this holding tank, they were held until this very moment when Jesus became the once and for all sacrifice. And Jesus literally descended into the lower parts. And you know what he did in the lower part of Hades? Some the old King James translation uh, translates it hell. He went down to the depths of hell. And one of the things he did down there was that he preached and declared himself to be who he is to those Old Testament saints and then glory to God he emptied the place out he emptied it out 
Now, that's not all that happened. You say, well, what did he say when he was down there? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 55. This is what he said. When he went to the lower parts, we have a quotation, a part of the message that Jesus preached in the lower parts. This is what he said. He said, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? He went to the lower parts. He went to the domain of the enemy. And he looked and he said, you threw your best punch and it wasn't enough. And while he was there emptying the place out of all the Old Testament saints, he also got one other thing. In Revelation 1.18, it tells us, it says, Jesus himself says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Jesus went and retrieved the keys. No one else holds these keys. No other religious figure holds these keys. No philosopher holds these keys. No great teacher has the keys. Jesus is the only one that has the keys to death and to the grave. He's the only one qualified to go get them. And I celebrate a Jesus who holds the keys. It sounds odd the way I'm about ready to say this, but it's really true. Jesus killed death. (laughs) He took away its sting. Death no longer has the last say. Death is not the end of the story. The cemetery is not the end of the story. The crematorium does not have the last say. You've got to understand Jesus holds the keys. Jesus has the last say. He's got the keys to these things. And I'll be honest with you. I'm just like most of you. I'm not in some big hurry to die. It's not like this is something I'm just every day saying, can't wait to die. No, I'm a human being. I, I think like most human beings, I think all of us would like to live full and satisfying lives. I, I want to see my children prosper and grow. I, I'd like to have some grandchildren along the way to enjoy. I mean, there's not some innate desire inside of me to rush death's knock on any of our lives but the good news is that if Jesus tarries it will come and and the point is is that you no longer have to fear that death is an enemy that you don't have to fear Jesus holds it in his hands and because he holds it I can boldly say that though I die yet will I live Because you see, what you're looking at is just a shell of who I am. One day the shell will go, but Kevin will live on. That's because my life is in the life giver. And that's the Jesus I celebrate. Number three, I celebrate Jesus because he's the one that rose for the victory. You know, it wasn't good enough for Jesus to just take back that which was lost. Although that would be an incredible story in and of itself, would it not? But in Colossians 2.15, this is what we read. It says that Jesus, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. You see, Jesus atoned for our sins on the cross. He went down to Hades and emptied the place out, retrieving the keys to death and the grave. And then he rose from the grave, which we celebrate today, to show us who might have the propensity to fear it, that all fear is gone. You know what the greatest fear about death is? This is what most of our fears are, is that for most of us, because we don't really think much about it until maybe a friend dies or a family member dies, and then we kind of think about it at that point. But for most of us, the reason death produces fear is because for a split second, you know, we, we, we are anxious because we, what, we, we ask ourselves, what's it going to be like? What's it, what's it feel like to be alive and then dead? What, what, what happens? And, and because there's, there's certain ambiguities, nobody can tell us exactly what's going on. No one can tell us exactly how it's going to feel. You know, the only time you're ever going to feel it is when it happens. 
It's, it's not like you can feel it. I think for most people, I mean, there's some near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences, and, and those are probably valid. But for most people, they don't have any of these experiences. And so the first time we're confronted with death, there's a lot of anxiety, maybe even fear, because we don't, we don't get what that feels like. How does that work? Will it hurt? You know, how does all this work? But here is what Jesus says. Jesus comes back. He rose from the grave, and he looks at us all, and he says this. You don't have to fear dying you don't have to be anxious in this regard no you don't have to rush to that moment but the truth of the matter is is that is that Jesus is the one that looks at us and says I've been through death I've been in the grave I've gone to the underworld I've seen it all I've come back and the good news is you're in good hands if you're in my hands says the Lord See, that's what Paul meant when he said that if Christ be not raised, then we are all men most pitiable. Because if we didn't have Jesus to tell us what it's all about, then yes, we would live in fear and darkness and anxiety. We would be seized with it. And it's amazing to me how you can watch people who don't know Jesus. You watch them die. And there can be great fear, but those on occasion you will find who have their lives sunk in the Lord there's a difference a Christian dies differently there's an old TV show that was called to tell the truth you ever remember that old TV show there'd be three people who would come out and they'd all pretend except for one of course two of them would pretend one of them would be the real person but they would all try to fool this panel of celebrities as to who was the real person and so the panel would ask these yes and no questions and they would try to figure it out and then at the end the host would finally say will the real you know so and so would you please stand up and they would stand up and you'd find out if all the celebrities had guessed the right one or not you remember the show yeah well you see we have a number of Jesus offered to us today there are a number of Jesus. I gave you seven of them earlier, but, but I'm here to tell you there's a number of Jesuses out there today. And after all the questions and concerns about who might be the right Jesus and the wrong Jesus, this is what happened. This is how the Father settled it all. He said, will the real Jesus please rise from the dead? That's the real Jesus. That's the Jesus I celebrate. He rose from the dead in order to punctuate and accentuate that all that he has said and done, you can count on. And then lastly, I'll leave you with this. The Jesus I celebrate was seen by hundreds and hundreds of people to know that he ever intercedes. I went through that Corinthian passage and I added up the number Paul states and somewhere close to 600 living people saw the risen Jesus with their own eyes, 600 people at different times. Now, hear me, if this was mass hallucination, it needs to be documented. B B have you ever heard of 600 people hallucinating on separate occasions, the same thing? Absolutely not. The truth is the resurrection is one of the best attested miracles in history. In fact, the resurrection is better attested to than evolution. I'll just leave it at that. We have 600 eyewitnesses to a resurrection. Who was there when this whole thing got started? I rest my case. I'm with Jesus. See, the reason the resurrection had to happen was because there had to be a documentable, reliable testimony that redemption was more than just theory. This isn't theory today. This isn't just preaching morality. This isn't just theoretically helping you live a better life. This stuff's real. Jesus is alive at this very moment, making intercession for those who will reach out to him by faith. Jesus didn't just arise and then go on his merry way. He arose and hundreds of people saw him. Get this, hundreds of people saw him. Jesus wasn't seen by just a person here or there, some hippie on the corner or some guy that had, you know, Coke bottle bottoms for glasses and, you know, and it means just some incredible uh, uh, witnesses. He was seen by credible people. And, and he walked amongst them. And he ascended to the Father and he's making intercession for his people. He's pleading 
our case before the Father. That's the Jesus I celebrate. And this, this is the good news. The good news is I don't have to go find another animal to sacrifice this year. I don't have to watch from a distance an earthly high priest go into the most holy place in order to sprinkle blood for me. I don't have to call out to my ancestors. I don't have to call out to people that are sitting in graves. I don't have to call out to angels or saints or Mary or whoever we're calling out to. I have an advocate. I have a substitute. I have a friend. I have the very Son of God who is alive, willing, and he takes my intercession as I mix them with faith, and he presents them before the throne of grace so that I can be heard. He goes and he says, Father, Kevin has prayed. I present this intercession to you because he asked it in my name, and he presents it before the Father, and the Father says, I will pay attention to this thing that Kevin has said. That's the Jesus I celebrate. I just ask you this morning, have you met this Jesus? Have you met him? Do you know him? Have you been able to give your life away to him and say, Lord, you're, everything I have is yours. And as we sang earlier, your dead heart now is beating because you're alive. The same power that raised him from the dead makes your heart and your life alive in him. This isn't my job, it's my privilege. This isn't a burden or an obligation. This is, this is an honor to be in his house today. This isn't, this isn't a box on my checklist that I said, yep, did that, did that, did that. Probably be a good thing if I went to church today. Did that, did that. Listen, this, this is the highest honor you can have is, is to be a servant in his kingdom, to know him, to know the real deal Jesus. Do you know him? Do you really know him? Is your dead heart beating? Is there a moment that you can look back to and you say that, that was the moment that I recognized that just like pastor, I'm, I'm born in sin too and I need a savior. And, and it's time that I owned up and I confessed my sin and that the weight of judgment and, and the weight of, of my sin which should have fallen upon me, Lord, it's too much now, and I, I, I gratefully cast it upon you. And as I cast it upon you, I turn, I turn from that way of living. And Lord, I'm believing right now as I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Listen, if all you've confessed is that Jesus is a good teacher, then you, you, you've not run into the real deal yet. You must confess him as Lord. Jesus, you're my Lord, and you're my Savior. And I receive you. And the scripture says that if I'll do that, then I can be saved and my dead heart will start beating again. It's, it's, it's spiritual electroshock. Zip! You're alive in him. Do you know him? Have you met him? Is your dead heart beating? This morning is the day 1.5 billion people will celebrate his resurrection. But my question is this, you may celebrate it, but, but is he alive in you? I want him to be. He wants to be. Do you want him to be? Stand with me, will you?